Well, good morning, beloved ones, and thank you for tuning in today. I'm recording this on Saturday morning, and uh, it looks like there's some pretty significant snowy weather moving in later this evening. So by the time we're all watching this, it may be the whole congregation at home watching right now, but I hope you are warm and well and that you're ready to hear from God's Word today. So let's pray. Father, we ask that you would grant our minds the ability to comprehend you and your truth, and that you would grant to our hearts the ability to treasure you and your truth. Father, would you apply your word to our lives in a transformative way today? And I pray for joy and for the peace of Christ to reign and rule in the hearts and minds of your people and we ask this all in Christ's name. Amen.
thank you, Emma. And today we turn back over to Ephesians chapter 1. We're finishing up this blessing section today where you will remember the Apostle Paul lays out before us all of these spiritual blessings God has granted to us, granted to us on the basis of His grace, granted to us through the person of Christ, and, and with the result of praise and glory being given unto Him. What makes this a blessing section. That's what we've been calling it all along. Why we are calling this a blessing section is that as the recipients of these gifts of grace, we are moved to bless God. We are moved to praise Him for all He has done for us in Christ. I don't want you to forget how the Apostle Paul begins this section in verse 3. You'll remember he says, Blessed be that is to say, praise and adoration unto the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God the Father is the one praised. Jesus the Messiah is the one who is highly exalted. It's essential to keep that in view. We're looking at all these spiritual blessings, but we're not the focus here. God is. And to help us see that, Paul has made it clear all along these blessings are Christ-centered, grace-granted, and glory-resulting. And so today we're going to look at the last two blessings Paul describes in verses 11 through 14. Namely, we're going to see we have obtained an inheritance and we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So let's look at our text, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 through 14. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. Well, here's where we're headed today. Just two main landing points. We have obtained an inheritance, and we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. So let's start with verse 11. We've obtained an inheritance. Now, before we go any further to describe what this inheritance is, I want to make a quick connection back with verse 5. Verse 5 and verse 11 have an essential connection between them. So in order to obtain an inheritance, you must first be an heir. You must be one who stands in the family lineage. And so here's the question. How did you become an heir of God? Well, verse 5 tells us this. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. That's how you became an heir. You've been adopted. And consequently, you have obtained an inheritance. So the importance of adoption as we think about it, it's not just that we have been brought into relationship with God as his children, as amazing as that is, but also, this adoption has made us heirs, recipients of an inheritance. And that's what Paul talks about in verse 11. We've obtained an inheritance. So let's think about what is this inheritance we have been caused to obtain? What is the heritage and the portion allotted to us as heirs of God? Well, many have described it in just one word. Salvation. Our salvation is our inheritance. And that salvation, we have it right now, and it will be fulfilled in all of its aspects one day. And that's absolutely true. But let's flesh that out a little bit. I think we can be more descriptive here thinking about our inheritance. I would describe it in more detail like this. Based on God's saving grace... And because of Christ's saving work, there is coming a day when the very nature of our existence, our individual existence, our, our corporate existence as we relate to one another, 
even the environment in which we live, the realm in which we live, the entirety of our existence will be one totally without sin and its effects because we have been transformed into the very likeness of Christ and the nature of that existence will com be completely full of God's glory and Christ's exaltation in all things. Now I know that's a wordy way of thinking about our inheritance. Let me put it like this. Our inheritance is a sin-free existence one where we're transformed into Christ's likeness and standing in the very presence of God, seeing his glory displayed in all things. I think Paul was getting at this back in verse 4 when he says, we will be holy and blameless before him. So I say all that because any aspect of your inheritance that you might be looking forward to, any future fulfillment of your salvation you might be looking forward to will flow out of this sin-free, transformed into Christ's likeness and God's glory-filled existence. So, for example, you think of your inheritance, maybe you think of something specific like, here's what I'm looking forward to, one day being reunited with my loved ones in Christ who've gone before. But you know what will make that reunion with your loved one so beautiful and Christ-exalting and praiseworthy? It's not just seeing them again. It will be seeing that person holy and blameless and transformed into Christ's likeness in the very presence of the glory of God. Or maybe you think about your inheritance as, as your home in heaven. You know, God has prepared a place for you. You know what makes our home in heaven so worth looking forward to? Whatever that heavenly environment looks like, we will see a place, we will exist in a place completely untouched by sin and its effects and full of the glory of God and Christ's exaltation everywhere you look. And it will naturally result in unending praise unto the Lord. I mean, you think... Nature is beautiful right now. And as far as our minds can comprehend it, it is beautiful. But in reality, and it's a reality we often forget, the environment in which we live right now is totally ravaged by sin and its effects. Just wait until you get to see and get to live in a place totally unaffected by sin, completely full of God's glory everywhere you look. Praise will abound. Joy will abound. What I'm saying is that any specific aspect of our inheritance we might be looking forward to flows out of this existence that is totally free of sin and its effects, where we are totally transformed to be like Christ, and it is completely full of God's glory in all things. That's our inheritance. And Paul talks about this inheritance, interestingly, in verse 11, as though we already have it. In Christ, we have been caused to obtain an inheritance. Beloved ones, it's a done deal. You have it. It can't be taken away from you. And it can't be taken away from you because God has given it to you, and he's promised it to you, and he's even given you a pledge guaranteeing the fulfillment of this inheritance. But that's verse 14. We're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's just stay with verses 11 and 12 a little bit longer. As we've been saying all along with these blessings, they are Christ-centered. They are grace-granted, and they result in glory being given unto God. And we see that here with this blessing of an inheritance. This inheritance is only obtained because of Christ. That is, in Him we have obtained this inheritance. Or we can put it this way. This inheritance cannot be obtained or fulfilled apart from Christ. Secondly, this inheritance is absolutely grace granted. Notice the rest of verse 11. Having been predestined 
predestined to what? Well, we learn specifically in verse 5, to be adopted as sons and consequently as heirs, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. So being adopted as heirs and thereby obtaining this inheritance has been predestined by God. It's totally of his grace. It's set forth according to the counsel and purpose of his will. In other words, that's not based on anything we have done, any merit or righteousness of our own. It was by God's gracious act of adopting us as his own and making us heirs. By the way, there's this little phrase here. He works all things after the counsel of his will. That is perhaps one of the most overlooked little phrases in this section because quite often the objection in reading through these blessings, if there is an objection, is about God's election unto salvation or God predestining our adoption as sons. Or really, quite often, there is this objection to what looks like God working in one way in one person's life, and it, and it looks like he may not be working the same way in another person's life. And so the objection is often, well, that doesn't sound very fair. But here's the thing, beloved ones. God doesn't work all things after the counsel of our will. He doesn't check in with me to say, well, what looks fair and what seems fair? And he works according to his purposes and after the counsel of his will and his alone. But big picture here, our inheritance is obtained according to his purpose, which is to say it's totally of his grace. And thirdly, notice it is glory resulting, look at verse 12, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to what end? To the praise of his glory. God predestining us to adoption as his sons and daughters, causing us to obtain an inheritance, is with this end in view that we would praise him, that we would see his glorious character displayed like his grace and praise him now and praise him forever. So, beloved ones, we've obtained an inheritance. It's Christ-centered, it's grace-granted, and it's to the praise of of his glory. Now, the last blessing Paul describes here in this lengthy section is the blessing of being sealed by the Holy Spirit. So look at verse 13. In him, that's in Christ, you also, after listening to the message or to the word of the truth, what's the word of the truth? Paul tells us it's the gospel of your salvation, and in him believing that second in him there in the verse, I think, goes with believing. In him believing, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So first, a couple of important ideas, and then we'll get to being sealed with the Holy Spirit, because we have these ideas of listening and believing here. And I want to make sure we're clear on these. So when you see in verse 13, listening to the message of the truth, or listening to the word of the truth, Listening is not just hearing. Listening in this context is the ability to comprehend the truth, the gospel of your salvation. It is you being enabled to comprehend the gospel and that it is the good news of your salvation and that this word, this message, is the truth. We've said it many times before, there was a time in our lives when the gospel sounded like utter foolishness and nonsense. And then one day we heard it, we, we listened, we heard it, and, and we were able to comprehend it for the truth that it is. How in the world is that possible? And then, right there alongside the comprehension of the truth, Paul names a believing in him, a believing in Christ an act of faith whereby you trust in him for your salvation. So how is this comprehension and this believing possible? Well, we've said this many times. It's possible because God deposits his spirit into us to enable us to comprehend the truth and confess Christ. 
This is the saving work of the Holy Spirit. But notice what Paul emphasizes here in verse 13 is the sealing work of the Holy Spirit. So we can emphasize a couple of things here. The Holy Spirit indwells us, enabling us to comprehend the truth and believe in Christ. But then the Holy Spirit also serves as God's seal in us and on us. A seal in those days was a distinguishing mark placed on letters or documents, and it actually served two very important purposes. First of all, the seal was a unique mark showing to whom the letter or the document belonged. So, a king, for example, would have a letter written, and then he would place his seal on that letter, and it, it authenticated it. It validated that it was his and from him. In that same sense, the Holy Spirit serves as God's mark on us, authenticating us as his very own and belonging to him. The seal in those days also served a second very important purpose, and that was to secure the contents of the letter. So a message would be placed inside an envelope, and then the king or the official would seal it, usually with a hot wax of some kind, and, and then the king would press his mark down into that hot wax, making his distinguishing mark. But that seal would safeguard the contents of the letter. In that same sense, the Holy Spirit indwelling us secures us, seals us, I'd put it this way, firmly establishes us in the truth and in believing in Christ so that we will not be shaken, so that we will be kept secure until the day of our redemption. If you have your Bibles open, Ephesians 4, verse 30, Paul emphasizes this. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. One of the early reformers put it like this. Quote, the true conviction which believers have of the word of God and of their own salvation does not spring forth from the flesh, but from the sealing of the Holy Spirit. But here's the blessing, beloved ones. Through the indwelling Holy Spirit, God has sealed you. He has marked you authentically as his in belonging to him. And he keeps you secure in Christ and in the truth. And then finally, notice here, the Holy Spirit is called the Holy Spirit of promise. Why? Because the Lord has this day of redemption in view where we receive the fulfillment of our inheritance. And the Holy Spirit is called the Holy Spirit of promise because God gives the Holy Spirit as a pledge, a good faith promise guaranteeing our inheritance. Verse 14, the Holy Spirit is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul says the Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. And so, as a guarantee of our inheritance that it will be completely fulfilled, God grants to us the Holy Spirit as a good faith promise. And the Holy Spirit will bring us safely to that day of redemption where we as God's people are delivered before him holy and blameless on that day of redemption. And notice, what does this result in? Look at the end of verse 14. To the praise of his glory. Isn't this what we've been saying all along? These blessings are Christ-centered and grace-granted and glory-resulting. So, let's take a step back. We've had all of these blessings before us over the past couple of weeks. Let's just summarize them. God chose us in Christ that we would be holy and blameless before him, verse 4. God predestined us to adoption as sons, verse 5. God has redeemed us and forgiven us our trespasses, verses 6 and 7. God has made known to us the mystery of his will, verses 9 and 10. 
We've obtained an inheritance, verses 11 through 12, and we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit, who's God's pledge and promise guaranteeing the fulfillment of this inheritance, verses 13 and 14. Beloved ones, don't forget all these blessings are Christ-centered, grace-granted, glory resulting. It is no wonder. Paul begins this section, verse 3, Blessed be all praise and adoration unto the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's close today with a prayer. Father, thank you for your grace granted to us. Thank you for your son Jesus whom you sent to save us and thank you for the ability and the opportunity to declare forth praise and adoration unto you. And Father, that's just a foretaste of what is to come. When we as your people stand before you holy and blameless, Father, I pray in these days you would meet and minister to the needs of all those listening. Father, there are burdens and anxieties and hurts that only you can heal and minister to. And I pray that you would do that even today. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.